Hi, this is Paula from Plantland, and we're back for the 2021 gardening season with our uh, online classes. We aren't going to do any in person this year. We're going to do all of this again. So we're going to start with this first one for seed starting. And before I get started, I just want to remind you that all the videos we did last year are on our website, plant-land.com. We'll take down last year's seed starting video because it was one of our not really great beginning ones and we'll replace it with this one. But there are lots of other videos there that we won't be repeating this year because they're already on the website. So let's get started with seed starting because it's time to think about that. It's time to start thinking about getting seeds started for your garden. Now, we usually do our, our seeds, uh, start seeds for three good reasons. The first one is that we want to have more choice, more varieties of things to uh, put in our gardens. You may want an eggplant like Black Beauty and you may not be able to find plants to put out of Black Beauty later in the season, but you can grow your own from seed. And it's especially true when you start talking about some of the pepper varieties, especially hot pepper varieties. Despite the fact that we grow literally dozens of pepper varieties, we don't, don't grow every single one into plants for you to buy. So seeds are a good way to get the different varieties that you want. Same thing with things like tomatoes. The next reason that you do it is because it's just a good idea sometimes to control the whole process from start to finish. If you're worried about uh, where you buy your plants and how they're handled and how they're treated before you buy them, um, growing your own from seed means that you can control that process from start to finish. The last reason is occasionally cost. Um, it's not really that much cheaper up front to grow your own stuff from seeds, but it can be once you get all the pieces and parts put together, all the things you're going to want to grow things from seed, it actually is much less expensive to buy a, a $2 packet of seeds than it is to buy all the pepper plants that would be in here. Now a lot of you probably bought seeds last year and planted. You may not have planted all the seeds in your packets. If you kept them in a cool, dry place, if you kept them where they didn't freeze over the winter, where they weren't exposed to extreme heat over the winter, or they weren't exposed to moisture, those seeds are more than likely still viable this year if you bought good seeds from a good vendor like Plantland. If you're not sure about them at all, you can always come in and buy more, and we're fully stocked with new seeds for this season. Our selection is really great. It's the best it'll be of the whole season. A good time to come in and pick up your seeds. If you're not sure about a packet of seeds that you had, you can do what's called a test germination. If you take four seeds out of the packet, put them in a paper towel that you've dampened, take that paper towel and put it inside a Ziploc bag and put it on your windowsill and then wait for a week to two weeks to see how many seeds germinate. You'll get an idea of the viability of the seeds you have left. So if one seed out of four germinates, you can expect that about a quarter of your seeds will germinate. If two germinate, you can expect that about half your seeds are still viable. Obviously, if three or four germinate, you can, you can simply say that all those seeds are still viable and you can use them again. So, not everything that we uh, put in our gardens has to be started from a plant that we put out in our, short, in our uh, growing season here in Montana. So we start some things from seeds, like tomatoes and peppers. We want to start them early this time of year or into March because we want to put out a fairly good sized plant when all danger of frost has passed sometime between the, the last couple weeks of May to the early weeks of June. So we're putting out, we're starting these to make fairly good sized plants um, that we're gonna put out later. And then there are some things and corn is a good example, or cucumbers, where we might start the seeds just a couple weeks before we're going to put them out because we still wanna put out small plants, but they'll germinate and they'll grow fairly quickly. And so we're just trying to get a smaller plant. We're just trying to bump that germination. <clears throat> and then there are plants that we won't do any kind of seeding ahead of time. We'll just direct sow into the garden these seeds, things like radishes and carrots. I spent part of the winter doing some new handouts and two of the ones I did, or one of the ones I did, is one called Seedlings and Plants Are Where. These are on our website and they're also available if you stop by the store to buy seeds. You can pick up a copy of this hand site, uh, handout and what it does is tell you which things that you need to grow 
uh, ahead of time as plants, when you need to start those seeds indoors, and it tells you what things you can direct sow into the garden. So I think that's a much more useful handout for everybody this year. Okay, so now, I'm, I'm just having to think a little bit. I'm not back in gardening mode yet. It's okay, Michelle, we don't have to start over. <laughs> um, the things you need to think about when you're getting your, your uh, ready to do seeds, you need to think about where you're gonna put them because seeds need a relatively high amount of heat to germinate. One of the other handouts that I did this year was soil temperatures for vegetable germination. Now, a lot of this is geared towards when you're planting seeds and when you're putting plants outside, but it's also something you can read to get an idea of which seedlings need to be kept in warmer conditions and which seeds will germinate at lower temperatures and which seeds will germinate at higher temperatures. Particularly if you're starting a big garden, you may have seeds so many seedlings that you're trying to start that it's a good idea to focus the ones that just need heat, higher heat, in a, one area and then ones that will germinate at cooler temperatures maybe in another area where you're not trying to, to keep it as warm. Generally speaking, most of these seeds we're talking about need a minimum of 65 degrees to germinate. A minimum. Even when it says on here that they'll germinate at a lower heat, you're going to have better results, faster results with that 65 degrees. And it's important that the heat stay constant. It's something where if you're trying to germinate seeds and you're growing them in a part of your house where the heat fluctuates a great deal because of uh, your automated thermostat or something, you're not going to have as good a result if that heat's going up and down constantly. One of the things we use to keep constant heat on, on plants, that seeds that need heat pretty consistently are these products called heat mats. A heat mat is something that's a very low temperature plastic heater. It can sit on all kinds of surfaces. I wouldn't put it on grandma's good uh, antique dining room table, but it's perfectly fine to sit on most countertops, to sit on uh, the metal of a freezer or refrigerator. It's perfectly safe to do that. It's not something that heats up. It doesn't get as hot quite as quite as hot as a heating pad would on a high setting, but it still gets fairly warm. But you can put plastic flats on top of it and it's not going to melt them. So that should tell, give you some idea of what the lower temperature is. And these heat mats, if you take care of them, last for a very long time. I've had mine for, for well over a decade now probably. And they're very simple. You just plug them in. They're, they don't take any kind of special heat or anything like that. And the, providing that heat for your seedlings, you're gonna to wanna to do that 24 hours a day. And you're also gonna, like I said, want to focus on the seeds that require some higher heat to germinate. So if you check that chart, that'll give you an idea what some of those things are. But I can tell you that tomatoes, peppers, eggplants are gonna be those kinds of things. So that's heat, that's the first thing that you're thinking about when you're doing this and where you're gonna site your, your seedlings. The next thing to think about is how you, what you're going to grow them in. There are flats, and this is all stuff we sell, flats with drainage holes in them, flats without drainage holes in them. The flats without drainage holes in them obviously are a good idea for things like seedlings, but you do have to be very careful with your watering that you don't have water building up in here. So if you're doing something without holes in it, drain holes in it, you've got to be able to drain your seedlings, uh, to drain that water out periodically. And then there's all sorts of containers that you can use. This is a peat pot, this is a coconut fiber pot. I didn't grab any plastic pots, but you, uh, you all know what a plastic pot looks like. Um, these are something that we use very specifically for certain kinds of plants. So there are some plants like cucumbers or corn, some of the squashes. Michelle's gonna hand me some forage plastic pots. Um, plants like cucumbers and corn and some of the squashes, when you come to buy them here at Plantland, you'll see they're planted in peat pots. And when we get to the, the uh, videos where we talk about uh, transplanting, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about these. The reason a lot of those are in peat pots is because they don't like being transplanted. Cucumbers are a great example of that. People will buy cucumbers in these little peat pots. 
take them home and take the whole peat pot off, transplant them, and then the cucumbers just die. They just lay over over the night and um, take die from transplant shock. These guys are meant to be are biodegradable. These co coconut fiber ones are biodegradable too. I really like these coconut fiber ones. Um, what it means is that's going to rot away in the soil. So typically you plant those plants that need to be in peat pots in these kinds of pots. If you look on the website and you'll see some of the handouts that we did on specific vegetables, and I'm continuing to update some of those and, and improve some of those, you'll see that some, there are some that we recommend that you put in peat pots. Something like a tomato plant, an eggplant, or a pepper um, doesn't have any problem being in a plastic pot. They'll, they'll transplant just fine out of a plastic pot. So that means that when you're doing something and you're trying to do some of the reuse, recycle thing, and you're, you want to use, for example, all your little plastic yogurt containers to do all your seedlings, don't do something like your cucumbers in it or your uh, corn or, or pumpkins in it. You really do need to get a biodegradable pot for that. And remember, if you're, you're doing the reuse, recycle, that egg cartons, or, um, cardboard egg cartons are also biodegradable. The other thing we sell are these little peat pellets, and this one's not quite uh, completely watered yet. This is what they look like dry. This is uh, soaked in water for about uh, 15 minutes or so, so far. It actually will get a little bit bigger. You'll see it has a hole in the top, has a little bit of netting on it. This is your nice starting mix. You just drop your seeds in that hole, and this can go in the ground. I think these are how much each? 20 cents. 20 cents each. So they're an actually a very economical way to grow just a few things if you just, if you're trying to do all that reuse and recycle and just have a few things you want to grow in a biodegradable medium. We'll touch that one again later. So all sorts of things are available. There's peat pot sets. There's uh, the little jiffy pellet uh, type set things. There's empty six packs, and there's six packs in all different kinds of sizes for these. Most garden stuff is all standard sizes. If you're growing something like um, a bunch of annuals that you wanted to grow, maybe a bunch of sweet peas or something like that, you can use these plug flats like we use here at Plantland. They're very handy. And all of this plastic stuff, even though we're not big fans of plastic, generally speaking, all of this plastic stuff will last for a very, very long time if you take care of it. If you take these flats and store them um, in a garage or store them in a shed, those flats will last forever. I have stacks of flats that God only knows how old they are. The next thing to talk about with seeds is what we grow them in. We don't grow them in, in garden soil necessarily, seed starts, now we're talking seeds we're planting in the house to put plants out later. We don't grow them in garden soil because it's too heavy. We don't necessarily grow them in potting soil because again, it can be too heavy, it can hold too much moisture. This is what's called seed start. It's a very specific product, very finely milled. So it it's, uh, actually has no soil in it. It's actually forest product product, which means wood chip ground, very, very fine. Usually there's a little bit of sand, usually there's a little bit of perlite or vermiculite in it. It's extremely fine. And the reason we do that, use this, is because all these plants have got to put out little fine roots. A lot of them are no finer than a, than a hair on your head. And they need to have good loose soil to put those tiny roots out into. The other advantage to this seed start is that it drains very consistently. It's something that will hold moisture evenly. It's really important, we'll talk more about moisture, but it's very, very important that your little seeds when they're trying to germinate and then your little seedlings don't get um, uh, dry. That we don't ever have a period when it's wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. It needs to be just a consistent moisture all the way across. And there's some techniques we use to do that at the beginning one of which is this, that we moisten our seed start before we plant anything in it. So seed start moistened, you 
can see it's too wet. If a lot of water were running out of my fingers, that would be too wet. But you see when I open my hand, it holds its shape. And what that means is that's the right kind of dampness that we're looking for. If that fell apart when I opened my hand, just fell apart like that, that means it's too dry. So what we tell you to do is take your seed start, take the amount you're gonna use, and put it in a bucket or, or a, a bowl or whatever you have to use and moisten it till you get to about this level of moisture. It's important to do this for two reasons. One, it makes it much easier to work with because so seed start has so much peat moss in it. If you try to water it after the fact, what happens is the peat starts to float and you end up with kind of a mess because your seeds can end up floating around in it too. And then the second reason is this moisture is going to be the initial moisture for your seeds. You probably aren't going to do a bunch more watering between the time you've planted your seeds and the time they germinate if you get this moisture level correct and if you cover your seedlings, that's what these domes are for. You see how this fits pretty tight over a flat, this is going to help hold that moisture in. So keeping that soil moist is very important. Now on a hot sunny day, we might take this off if the seedlings have come up. But before the seeds have germinated, generally speaking, we can leave this on all the time. You do want to check your moisture level, and if you see that you need more moisture, if it seems like things are starting to dry out, the best method of, of watering is a good spray bottle. Don't try to do it with a watering can or anything like that. Try to do it with a spray bottle. So that covers our growing medium. It covers our uh, what we're growing stuff in as far as containers. And then the last thing, or I shouldn't say the last thing, um, the next thing to talk about is uh, grow lights. Now seedlings are going to come up. Uh, the the seed starting handout I've, I've rewritten for this year talks a little bit about light. There aren't a lot of seeds that require light for germination. Some do, but the majority don't. If you think about something like a pumpkin seed, which is a fairly big seed, when you read the seed packet, it's going to tell you to plant it about an inch and a half or so deep or more deep. It's not getting any light down there to germinate. So it doesn't really need light to germinate. So when we're in that period when we're just planting our seeds and we're just getting started, we aren't quite as concerned about light. We're much more concerned about heat being uh, consistent and warm, and we're concerned about moisture being consistent and um, damp. There are a handful of tiny, tiny seeds that do require some light to germinate, but generally speaking in the vegetables, we really aren't talking any that, that necessarily do. So it's very important to remember that. Now, once your seedlings come up, we have a whole nother set of things to talk about. So we'll do that in another video. But one of the things I wanna just go through really quick before we finish this part is I just wanna talk about the seeds that we start early. So this time of year, we're talking the, the uh, middle to end of February, and we're talking the first two weeks of March, we wanna get our tomato plants started and we wanna get our pepper plants started. So on tomato plants, one of the things you'll see is that there's different days on these. You'll see like this uh, Roma tomato is an 80 day tomato. Uh, a beefsteak tomato is a 96 day tomato. A brandy wine is a 80 day tomato. And what that means is it's not 80 days from seed going in the ground to having a red tomato in your hand. It's 80 days from the plant producing a flower to you having a red tomato in your hand. So that's the math you have to do to figure back where you're, what, when you're going to start stuff. And I do a much better job of explaining this in all these handouts. But you'll see days on lots and lots of seed packs. This uh, eggplant says 80 days. Again, that's going to be from flower to an eggplant that you could eat. On the other hand, you'll see something like a, a 
carrot here that's 65 days. A carrot's something we would plant directly, the seed directly in the ground. 65 days is plenty of time to grow a, a full grown carrot here in Montana. And what that 65 days on this seed packet means, it's 65 days from germination to a carrot you could eat. Because this isn't something where we're looking for a flower to produce. Um, each seed is going to produce one carrot. Whereas each tomato seed is gonna produce a plant that produces multiple tomatoes. I, I, I know I explained this better in the handouts. <laughs> Michelle's left just looking at me because I'm babbling. Um, the other thing that you might think about starting this time of year are onions. And we don't mean green onions. We don't mean like bunching onions that you use in salads. We mean onions that you want to start like a red onion or a yellow onion or a white onion. Now typically we grow these here in Montana from sets, which are small onions that we um, plant that onion and get bigger onions from. But if you want to grow your own onions and not count on those sets, now is the time of year to get your onions going. Same thing with leeks. It's something where you want to start them pretty early in the year indoors so that you have fairly good sized plants to put out. And we've started at Plantland. These are our Walla Wallas starts. So if you come in, uh, if you're familiar with growing Walla Wallas, which are the nice big sweet onions, this is the little plants that you'll see in bundles later that are starts. This is, this is the start of that. And you can see how they've been grown. I bet these are probably three weeks old. Yep. Um, you can see the seed still sitting at the top. Doesn't matter, you don't have to pluck those off. I'm just, just being OCD. Um, at any rate, this is a good example of onions or something that you would grow ahead of time to put out these, like these Walla Wallas. Now, if these get taller, when these get up to something like this, and you haven't been able to put them out yet, which could be true if we had some late snow, you actually can take and just snip these and they'll be just fine. So onions are one that you wanna start get started now. Otherwise, there's some of the cool weather things like cauliflower and cabbage, Brussels sprouts and broccoli, that if you want to put out fairly good sized plants, um, when it's time to put those plants out, you might want to start these sometime in early March in your house. But other things that you would start plants for that, and uh, put out, things like uh, some of the squashes, you might do that with, uh, well, celery, melon, cucumbers, corn, peas, beans, any of that kind of stuff that you're thinking you want to put plants out later for, you can start those seeds much later than now. So that's kind of the basics of getting your seeds started. And what we're going to do is now stop and then we'll start another video that's going to be about what you're going to do with your seedlings once you have them started once the seeds have germinated and they've come up. So look for that one next. And this is Paula from Plantland and happy gardening.